Uh, let me just ask a question to maybe some of the gentlemen. It's probably more appropriate to you. Uh, gents, can I ask you, and I'm not trying to get you into trouble, uh, but have you ever forgotten an anniversary? No? A birthday? Have you done something worse? Uh, most of us, we get it. We, we, we're humans. We make mistakes. We forget. And what happens? You need grace. You need forgiveness. You need a second chance, don't we? Or is it just me? Of course, I wonder, I, I wonder if in the grand scheme of things, you've, you've done things in life that now as you get a little bit older, a little bit more mature, a little bit wiser, you look back on in horror. And you think, why did I ever do that? How did I ever do that? And you understand that actually it, it's the kind of thing that could finish you. It could have sent you off a completely different path were it, not, were it not that somebody showed you grace or compassion or kindness. It, were it not that someone gave you a second chance. See, the truth is for most of us, if we're vaguely human, uh, most of us need second chances in life. In, in fact, I, I've actually, I, I'm on number 478th chance, I think. I'm so far down the line. We need second chances. Uh, certainly, as we come to this section in Jonah, Jonah needs a second chance. Uh, remember the story? Uh, God had sent him to Nineveh to preach, and he ran away. He thought he'd escaped God, so he was fast asleep down at the bottom of a boat uh, when God found him in a big storm and a, and a whirlwind of waves. And Jonah had to be thrown overboard. It was the only way to save the other sailors. But, but, but don't worry, he got swallowed by a big fish. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the good thing or the bad thing, but he got swallowed by a big fish. And, and, and he realizes his error of his ways. He realizes he's made a mistake. And it's in the belly of the fish, essentially, that he, he cries out and asks for a second chance. A second chance. And so this is how chapter 2 finish, finishes. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. See, see Jonah, God heard your cry. He's put you back on dry land. He's put the second chance in front of you. What now? We know it's a second chance because look at how chapter 3 starts. It starts almost identically to the way chapter 1 started. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Uh, this has got the phrase, a second time. Uh, here is a God of grace. Here is a God of compassion. Here is a God of kindness. Here is a God of second chances. A God of second chances. It's probably, it's probably helpful and important to just say that sin doesn't always get a second chance. You see, sometimes our sin can be of such a heinous nature that there isn't a second chance. Uh, it won't be overlooked. It won't be turned a, a different direction. Uh, which is why we must not presume on our sin that God, because he is gracious and compassionate, will always give us a second chance. But in this instance, in this instance, because of the purposes of God, in his grace and mercy, he grants a second chance. And he does that because he understands the salvation of one Hebrew sinner will ultimately lead to the salvation of many, many Ninevite sinners. And so as we look at this chapter together this morning, I want you to notice that as you read the text, it seems there are three about turns, three turnarounds, three complete changes that we see evidenced in the text. And the first is obviously Jonah's. I've called it Jonah's repentance because the word repentance means about turn, means go in the opposite direction. And in chapter 1, he was called and sent, and he got up and went the opposite direction. But here we're told, we're told that he's a new man. Surprisingly, verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. The truth is, by now, we're a little bit skeptical of him. By now, we, we weren't too sure what he would do. But he obeys the word of the Lord this time. He does what he's called to do. And I think in this instance, his obedience is the fruit of repentance. So he repented in the belly of the fish. He came to understand his sin. And he pledged a changing of ways. Here's how he understood repentance. It was to turn from his sin and return to God. And that is a work of grace in Jonah's life. It's God's grace that turns him and molds him and shapes him. 
Indeed, it's God's grace in this very moment that is equipping him for the task ahead. In fact, God's grace has been at work in Jonah's own heart so that not only will he turn and come back to God, but that he'll understand that that's exactly what every sinner needs to do. Every sinner needs to repent. Every sinner needs to return. And so God has used the first two chapters graciously to equip Jonah for his ministry that starts in verse 4. Did you pick it up? See, in chapter 4, he begins to proclaim the message. It's a simple message, if truth be told. And yet it's incredibly profound. The end is near. Judgment is coming, he tells them. Forty more days... And Nineveh will be overturned. I had the great joy the other day of being with a young adult's Bible study. And uh, because I'm that way inclined, which is basically I'm a wicked sinner, uh, I, I love to play with words. And I asked them what the gospel is. And they said to me, the gospel is good news. And with a smile on my face, I said to them, but is it? Of course, when the minister says to the young adults, the gospel is not good news, it's very confusing, isn't it? So let me ask you the same question. Do you think the gospel is good news? See, it's good news to you only if you've heard it. It's good news to you only if you've received it. It's good news to you only if you've responded to it. See, otherwise the gospel, if truth be told, is incredibly bad news. (laughs) Because there's a side to the gospel that we don't like to talk about. See, there's a side to the gospel that we, shh, don't say anything. Uh, We're happy to talk about the Savior who dies on a cross to take away your sins. We're happy to talk about the resurrected Lord who rose from the grave to conquer death and defeat the enemy. We love that story. That's good news, salvation. But remember, we also, as part of the gospel, have a king who will return to judge the living and the dead. A judge of all, before whom everyone will stand and give an account. Oh yes, salvation is good news. But for those who reject the Savior, judgment is bad news. It's bad news. It's frightening stuff. And so when we preach the gospel, and we preach the gospel in its entirety, remember it has an element that is terrifying. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. See, the only way to avoid that is to take refuge in the salvation that God offers and in the way that God offers it. And so we must understand afresh today that fundamental to the gospel is the message of judgment. It's fundamental to the gospel. Jesus will return as judge of all. There will be a reckoning. And the world, the world needs to hear that today. I know that that's a very unpopular message. I know that that that's why you don't want to share the gospel sometimes with your friends. It's it's why I don't want to share the gospel sometimes with my friends and my family. It's really unpopular, isn't it? It's it's not the way you're going to get a second helping of dessert at a dinner party, is it? Jesus is coming to judge you. You're all going to die and spend eternity in hell. (laughs) There's a way to win friends and influence people. But if the scriptures tell us that judgment is coming, If God tells us that judgment is coming, we've got to be very careful not to pretend it isn't. It's unpopular, but it's true. It might be today you need to hear that. It might be today that you're you're flirting with religion and you're flirting with Jesus. You're doing the church thing because it looks good on the outside, but, but truth is, truth is you're not interested in God or Jesus. Or maybe you need to remember that it's not all good news. It's bad news. If you reject Jesus, it's very bad news. And so, of course, as we discover, Jonah has turned around, and he is now preaching the gospel, and preaching the gospel in its fullness. The question remains, what will Nineveh do? It's the second thing to notice, not just Jonah's repentance. But will you notice Nineveh's repentance? You see, we're told at the very start that Nineveh is a terrible city. It's a terrible city. And not only is it big, and not only is it important and significant, but by their own definition, in verse 8, they tell us that it's a city marked by evil and violence. 
The truth is they've got no time for a prophet of Israel, especially one who wants to come and speak judgment. They're too busy getting up to mischief. They're too busy with wickedness. And yet to his credit, Jonah preached, and he preached it faithfully. And he told them of impending judgment. And then we read the most shocking thing we read. You see it then, verse 5? The Ninevites believed God. They believed God. They changed their ways. They repented. They believed. They declared a fast. They put on sackcloth. Uh, Did you notice how spontaneous it was? On the first day, there was no hesitation. There was no debate. It was instant, in a moment. I know so often we think uh, we've got to get people onto a six-week program. We've got to get them onto a 12-step course. Can I just remind you that when you preach the gospel faithfully, (laughs) in an instant, people can be converted. Uh, Will you notice it was spiritual. They believed God. It was a spiritual reality. They encountered the God of the Bible. They encountered the God of heaven and earth. They encountered the God of Israel. This is the true God. And they heard him. They heard him. And they took him at his word. They understood that if this God says judgment is coming, ish, we better be careful. It must be true. And we see sincerity in their action. Did you notice how they declare a fast? They put on sackcloth. Now, it doesn't always mean much to us today, but those are, those are outward marks of mourning, of grief, of bereavement. They, these are the outward marks of repentance. So you put on sackcloth because you were in self-denial. You, you understood you could do nothing. You were broken and frail. It was this fasting and sackcloth that expressed complete inability to contend with what God has said in his word. See, they understood that God is God and they are not. And if God says judgment is coming, they had better be afraid. They had better be afraid. You see, they, they understood that they were nothing. They were simply slaves of the sovereign God. And did you notice how, how chapter 3 reminds us that it was across the board, it was sweeping, From the greatest to the least, from the poorest to the richest, even even the king. I mean, here is the most incredible picture in Jonah chapter 3. This prophet walks across the city preaching the gospel. And as he preaches at every step of the way, they believe, they repent, they change. They turned to God. Nineveh, Nineveh repented. Frankly, that's a shock. It's a shock. I guess, I guess in one sense, we, we, we think of the gang areas in our, in our area. We think of uh, Lavender Hill or Sea Winds. And in our mind, we've got this picture of them. Can you imagine what happened if I said to you, Luke Giles walked through some, some Lavender Hill, and as he preached the gospel, Lavender Hill believed. And repented, every one of them, gang leaders, every one of them, heard the gospel and believed. Impressive? No? I think it is. I think it's pretty cool. And and so I'm I'm in my little brain, I'm saying, you know, we know that Jonah's a failure. We know that Jonah's human. We know that Jonah is weak and frail. Uh, We know that Jonah doesn't really want to be here. And in fact, uh, spoiler alert, he's going to be really miffed by the end of the chapter. Uh, Come back to chapter 4, you're going to see how he's going to spend all of chapter 4 sulking. Uh, He's not happy to be where he is doing what he's doing. And so I can't help but asking myself, what, what would cause this population of hardened Gentiles, hardened Assyrians, to react so favorably, so penitently, to the preaching of this lowly, frail prophet of Israel? I hope you've worked out the answer. See, it's got nothing to do with Jonah. No, it's only the power of God. And it's only the power of the gospel. You see, remember his grace worked in Jonah, and Jonah repented. And his transforming grace works in Nineveh, and Nineveh repents. But here's the shock. The shock in chapter 3 is that there's a third change. There's seemingly a third about turn 
Uh, there's somebody else who changes his ways and goes in the opposite direction. I don't know if you picked it up while Juliet read for us. See, the third picture is of a God who repents. And I've put that in inverted commas for a deliberate reason. You see, it seems that God does an about turn. It seems that God who promised destruction changes and sends deliverance. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. As we'll see when we get to chapter 4, Jonah is not at all happy with God's change of mind. He's not at all happy that God has changed his ways. And can I suggest to you, there's some good reason for that. Can I just tell you that if we serve a God who changes his mind arbitrarily, we're in trouble. You you don't want a God who's fickle. You don't want a God who changes his mind willy-nilly. That kind of God is unpredictable. You never know whether you're on his right side or his wrong side. In fact, if you have friends of different faiths, if you ask them, uh, one particular faith, when you ask them, can you be sure you'll be going to heaven even if you've done all the right things? Do you know what their answer will be? It depends on the mood of Allah. So you ask your Islam friends, your Muslim friends, ask them when they've done the five pillars, when they've done everything, are they sure? Are they guaranteed a spot? And they will say, well, it depends. It depends whether God's in a good mood or not. See, that's the problem with a fickle God. And so, so as we read about a God who changes, a God who changes his mind, we should be saying, hey, hold on. That makes me a little bit nervous, doesn't it? Until you work out that Luke is just playing with words again. See, the fact is God relents for the very reason that he is unchanging. God relents for the very reason that he is unchanging. See, God does not change in that their repentance has caught him off guard and he's now going to plan B. That's not what's happening here. Nor is God changing in the sense that he no longer does what he intended to do all along. Now God's doing exactly what he intended. See, God doesn't send destruction, he threatened, because he is unchanging. He is unchanging in his compassion. He is unchanging in his grace. God is always true to his character, and God is always true to his word. Listen to his word in Jeremiah chapter 18. This is what God himself says. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. You see, in Jeremiah, God says, he says, we preach judgment, and we preach judgment so that people will turn. And when they turn, God will always be gracious, and always be forgiving, and always relent from sending that calamity. God's character was and God's character is and God's character always will be to forgive every single one who repents and believes. That has not changed and that will never change. God always acts in grace and always acts in compassion and always acts in mercy. And for that oak that's on number 487th of needing a second chance... (laughs) I'm very grateful that the God I serve is a God of grace and mercy. I'm very grateful that when we repent and believe, God is faithful and true to forgive us, to cleanse us, and to make us whole. I am very grateful that no matter what I have done, no matter how many mistakes I have made, I am very grateful for the gospel that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, we've got three movements here. Three movements of how Jonah and Nineveh and God have brought about salvation on these people. 
Uh, Jonah's message, Nineveh's repentance, God's compassion teach us much this morning about salvation. Uh, Let me just quickly throw a few things at you as we finish. The first thing I want you to notice as you reflect on these three things is I want you to notice that salvation is always by God's grace. God's persistent grace pursued Jonah when he tried to run away. Uh, And he does that because he knows that as he pursues Jonah, so he will save the Ninevites. God is persistent in his grace. And God is powerful in his grace. There's no city, there's no person, there's no community, there's no area, there's no next door neighbor that is so far gone that they're outside the reach of God's grace. Just let that wash over you again because you've got somebody in your life that you think about that. You know who I'm talking about. There's that person in your life, that family member, that just rubs you up the wrong way, that bites you, that irritates you, that annoys you, that might actually be really wicked and evil in your eyes. Uh, They might be wicked and evil in real life. And in your mind, here's what you've said. You've said, they're too far gone. Nineveh was a wicked and evil city. And every one of them repented and believed. No one is outside the reach of God's grace, his unchanging grace that does not send destruction when there is repentance and when there is faith. Yes, he will threaten judgment, he will tell you of judgment, he will warn you of judgment, but in his grace and mercy where there is repentance, there will always be forgiveness. So I wonder if that's your view of God. I wonder if your view of God today is that you know that he is gracious and compassionate He is slow to anger. He is abounding in love. He is a God who relents from sending calamity. And I wonder as you know that, as that washes over you, I wonder if that stirs your heart to praise and to thanksgiving and to confidence and to assurance. See, the reason I have hope before God has got nothing to do with Luke Giles and his record. Let me tell you now, he's a failure and he messes up all the time. But I serve a God who is unrelentless in his grace and in his mercy. Salvation is always by grace, but it's always through the gospel. See, faith comes from hearing and responding to the gospel, the whole gospel. Uh, The message of a savior on a cross, but the message of a judge on a throne. The whole message of the gospel. See, if you think about it, the offer of salvation makes no sense to your friends, makes no sense to your family, if you've lost judgment. If you've lost the car, you, you go and do that. Go, go and do that to somebody at Steenberg Estate who's living it up on one of the finest estates in the world and you say to him, you need to be saved. Por qué? Like looks at you and he says, he says, have you seen my lifestyle? I'm living on the finest, what are you talking about? I need to be saved. See, in his perspective, he doesn't need to be saved. Saved from what? See, calling people to salvation makes no sense. Unless we preach a gospel of judgment, of accountability for sin, of a God who will hold him accountable. Now it is the power of salvation for those who believe. We must cling to that. That's why we preach the gospel. But we must preach the whole gospel. That's why Paul says, don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed of it. Preach it faithfully. Proclaim no other gospel than this gospel. The gospel that God has given us to preach. The gospel about his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's about grace and it's through the gospel and you can see where this is going. It's going to demand that some will have to go. See, some will have to go. They cannot believe unless they hear. They cannot hear unless someone proclaims and they cannot proclaim unless they are sent. That's what Romans 10 says. Not all of Israel went to Nineveh. They didn't all go. God sent Jonah, one prophet. But if we want the world to hear then we need to send workers into the harvest field. Do you know that Coca-Cola are better at reaching the world than the churches? Coca-Cola are better at reaching the world than the churches. They're everywhere. Everywhere you go, you find a Coke can. See, will we send workers into the harvest field and will we send them into the harvest field to the far ends? So here's the thing. Either you go, pack your bags, you're going on a guilt trip, either you go or you partner with somebody who is going. You do it through somebody else. That's the option. We are never, ever given the option of writing nations off, saying we don't need to worry about them. We don't need to think about them. No, exact opposite. 
We are told, take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Make disciples of all nations. And so if we're not going to go, then we must send more workers into the field. A workers who will cor- courageously proclaim the gospel, fearlessly telling the good news of Jesus, fearlessly telling the bad news of Jesus too. Sometimes to those who are hostile. Not just to the open countries, but to the closed countries as well. And when we do that, what are we looking for? Well, by God's grace, through the gospel, as the message is proclaimed, what we're wanting is we're wanting lives to be changed. We're wanting godliness from everyone. See, what we want is for people to return to God. We want people to believe. We want people to repent. We want people to come home. Now, that's been the story along the way here. Jonah had to repent and come home. Nineveh had to repent and come home. You have to repent and come home. The world has to repent and come home. That is called godliness. Our godliness is when we stop living for ourselves and start living for God. When we stop living the way we want to live and we live the way God wants us to live. See, the fruit of repentance and faith is always, it's always godliness. And so we want a world that will change. We want lives that will change. We want, we want a nation and an individual who will give up their evil ways and their violence. He will bow the knee to God and live lives for him and for him alone. Can I suggest to you that that's intensely personal? It's intensely personal. It's something you have to do. And here's the thing. You might be nice today. You might even be morally a good person. Uh, You're sitting in a church. That's surely some credit to you. But here's the thing. If you haven't repented of your sin, and if you haven't trusted Jesus, then you're not saved. Then the good things you're doing are not godliness. They're just good things. They're just nice things. Now, godliness flows from salvation. Godliness flows from when we repent and believe the gospel. And so I want to say to you today, if you haven't repented and believed, I need to say to you, you're not saved. You might be nice. You might be moral. You might be upright. You might be helpful and kind. You might be a whole bunch of good things. But if you have not repented and believed the gospel of Jesus, you are not saved which means God's judgment is still a very real threat. And it might be if that's you today, you want to talk to me or somebody else about that. We'd love to talk to you after the service if you'll listen to us. Not just personal, it's practical, isn't it? Because for many of us here, we will say, well, we have repented and we have believed. Then I want to remind you that you've received grace in order to say no to ungodliness and yes to righteousness. You've received grace in order to live the life that God has called you to live. To live a life of godliness. In other words, produce the fruit accordingly. Stop living for yourself and start living for God, doing what He wants you to do. Have His priorities. Put your time and talents and treasures to kingdom things. Live for God, not for yourself. And the good news is you'll make a mistake. But you know something? When you make a mistake, God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Our God is the God of second chances. And so here's the thing. If you've got that second chance, will you use it for yourself? Or will you use that second chance for him and for his glory and for his kingdom?